title of this evening's lesson is How Can I Help My Church? And this is a positive thing. This isn't a negative thing. None of us should look at any of this in a negative way. We should view all of these things in a positive way. And we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses because all of us here, as far as I know, we're all human. I think we are. I hope we are. And so these things are positive things, but we also understand who we are as people with strengths and weaknesses. I've always been one of those people who felt like it was best to focus on your strengths and try to do your best to really capitalize on your strengths and then to not let your weaknesses become a problem or a hindrance. And so because there are just some things that I can't do. I cannot dunk a basketball. I never could. And so I didn't need to focus on that. But I could run fast and it meant I could defend. And so I got to play basketball on the high school basketball team because I was able to keep up with the other players and play defense. And so we need to capitalize on the things we can do and not let our weaknesses become a problem to us. So I have the different things in this list that I gave you this evening about how I can help my church. How can I help my church? And I felt like as I was doing this, studying for this, that the most important thing that I could do to help my church is to pray. I've been here about 11 and a quarter years, and, and I've been preaching and preaching that uh, we should pray and pray and pray. And we don't need to miss prayer meetings. You, you just don't need to miss prayer meetings. And, and you need to visit that prayer room before every service. And, and going to the prayer room isn't just about you. It's also about what happens in the church service. Going to the prayer room before a service tells God, God, we need you in this service. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so we don't need to miss our church prayer meetings or, or visiting the prayer room. You see, there's power in prayer. There's great power in prayer. There's awesome power in prayer. There's, there's amazing power in prayer. Yes. And the Apostle Paul told us, he said, pray without ceasing. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe there's any of us who can pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't think that's physically possible. We need to sleep. We need to eat. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to work jobs. We need to pay bills. And so I don't think Paul was telling you or telling me, pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. So how can I pray with, without ceasing? This is how you can pray without ceasing. Paul told Timothy, he said, to be instant in season. He said, you be instant in season. In other words, any time that prayer needs to be prayed, that you're able to go ahead and start praying. That you don't have to say, well, um, Tuesday night is prayer meeting, and so when I get there, I'm going to pray about this. Sometimes you need to pray right now. Sometimes situations call on you to pray immediately. And if you're in a grocery store and you come across someone with a need, you should be able to pray. And so that is one of the ways that you can be uh, uh, praying without ceasing and you're always ready to pray. Another way to pray without ceasing is this, to stay on track in your prayer life. You should start every day with prayer. Every morning, my son and I, we pray on the way to school. We get dressed and we head to school and we pray from the time we leave our house until we start reading the Bible on the way to school. And, and then when I drop him off, I pray all the way to the church when I get to the office. And when I get here, I kneel down in my, my chair in my office and I pray some more. So I spend a lot of time praying every morning. And you need to do the same thing. And I don't know that yours is going to look just like mine. But the psalmist said in the 63rd Psalm, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. He said, early will I seek thee. The very first person you need to talk to when you uh, begin your day is Jesus. There will be enough stuff that goes wrong in your life 
There will be enough people who are negative, enough people who are problems. That if the first person you talk to is Jesus, you're going to start your day a whole lot better. And everybody else in your life is going to be better off if you have started your day with prayer. So don't let anything or anybody stop you from talking to the Lord. Start your day with prayer. Now let me tell you two things. Prayer blesses you, yourself. So when I pray, it blesses me. But prayer also blesses everybody else for whom I have prayed. And prayer blesses the church. Prayer blesses our city. Prayer blesses our families. Prayer blesses our friends. Do I want to be a blessing to others? There are some people, the, the way they act, I'm pretty sure, they don't want to be a blessing to anybody else. But I do want to be a blessing to others. And praying is one of the easiest and best ways for me to be a blessing. Amen? Amen? Now, Jesus said this. He said in Matthew and Mark and Luke, he, he, it was recorded by all three of them. It is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And, he, and then I, I want to put this in modern vernacular for us. He says, but you have made it everything else. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it everything else but prayer. Now, we know that he was talking to those people there that day that had set up places to sell uh, different animals for sacrifices and different ointments and so forth for all the different rituals they have. We understand that that's what they were doing. But we today in our modern world begin to set up everything else in church. And I do not have a problem with us doing other things here on this campus. This is an awesome campus. God blessed us with it. But the number one thing here and the most often thing here should be prayer. Prayer should happen here more than anything else. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And so I love men's breakfast. It's a blessing to me. It's a blessing to others. All the men who attend it are blessed by it. I'm thankful we have men's breakfast. But you shouldn't love men's breakfast or attend men's breakfast more than you attend the prayer. Sorry, Brother Villard. Pancakes are great, but prayer's better. There are so many things about which we should pray. I'm going to ask you to put your number one prayer request for revival. Revival and evangelism. I want you to mark your prayer list that you have that you used to pray. That you would pray for revival and evangelism every day. Another item I want you to put somewhere on your list is that you would pray for me as your pastor and pray for my family. You should pray for all the ministers in the church, not just the preachers, all the ministers in the church. That they would minister with anointing, that they would minister with strength, that they would minister with insight. That God would quicken their hearts and minds, that they would minister well. Pray for those who are sick. I like to be prayed for when I'm sick. Pray for those who are suffering. Pray for those who are going through a trial. Pray for those who are like Demas and have walked away from God. They can come home, you know. And so those are just some of the prayer requests that you should have on your list. And I want to encourage you to make a prayer list. Do it on a notebook pad. Do it on a computer. Do it on a tablet. Whatever you do, I don't care. But make yourself a list so that you pray about things. So the second thing that you can do to help your church is to fast. Now, we collectively are joining together to fast the first three and a half days of each month, giving God the first 10% of our month. And there are many thoughts concerning the work of fasting. But the most important thing I want you to remember about fasting is what Jesus said about it. Jesus said, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There are some things that are only going to happen if you fast. 
And so there are some things that you're never going to see in life if you're not willing to fast. And so I don't want to be one of those people. I want to see the supernatural happen. I want to see things happen in the Holy Ghost. I want to see dead uh, bodies raised back to life again. I want to see deaf ears open and hear again. I want to hear the dumb talk, and even though they were born unable to talk. I want to see the lame walk. I want to see our altars filled with people getting the Holy Ghost. I want to see our classrooms filled with children. I want to see our youth class filled with young people. And when you fast, you help to break all the chains. Jesus was talking to his disciples when he said this because they were unable to do some things in the spirit. And so if you want to do some things in the spirit, you're going to need to fast. Now, I want you to join with us collectively fasting the first three and a half days of each month because that's unity. But you should also fast throughout the month in different ways on your own. Because some things just are only going to happen if you fast. So my question is, how badly do you want it? Now, this may seem very rude. I have a very rude question. But do you think you are good enough without fasting? I know I'm not. I'm not good enough without fasting. I'm not good enough with it. But I'm worse without it. I know I need to fast. Remember, it was to his disciples. If Jesus told his disciples, you're not good enough without fasting, then by all means, Darren Michael Williams is not good enough without fasting. Everyone needs to fast and everyone needs to pray. In reference to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, the Bible says he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant of the Ten Commandments. He fasted 40 days and nights with no bread, no water. He consumed nothing for 40 days and nights. But he wrote what the Lord told him to write. In reference to the prophet Elijah... Bible says he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days and 40 nights, he survived on what he had eaten there that day. He was on the run. He was being chased by Jezebel. He was hiding in a cave. But the Lord sustained him for 40 days and 40 nights as he consumed nothing else. And then, of course, the third person, Jesus. The Bible says he was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And if Jesus Christ, the son of man, said, I will begin my ministry with fasting, then you and I need to understand that fasting is a critical element of living for God. Now, I am not recommending to any of you that you fast 40 days and 40 nights and certainly not without water. But what I am telling you is that you need to find a way to fast. And so for that, I'm going to turn you to Daniel chapter 10. The Bible says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. And he says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three weeks were fulfilled. So basically, Daniel's saying, I didn't eat anything that tasted good, basically just drank water. And I didn't even bathe myself for three weeks, sacrificing myself to the Lord. Now, I, Daniel's fast is not the same thing as a, a true full fast. But my point is, you can find some way to submit your flesh to the will of God so that things happen in the spirit. I've told you this before, and I'll tell you over and over again, because I want everyone to find some way to fast. People who take medication every day and they have to eat when they take their medication can eat and take their medication and fast the rest of the day. Then the next day they can eat and take their medication and fast the rest of the day. There are different ways that you can fast, but you need to fast. Some things happen only through prayer and fasting. 
So the next way that I can bless my church, help my church, is to worship and to praise. Because your worship and your praise doesn't just affect you, it affects others and it affects God. The Bible says on multiple occasions that the worship and the praise of the Israelites moved God. I want to move God, amen? Not worshiping hurts others. When you don't worship, you hurt others. And the psalmist said in the 47th Psalm, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. It is a command of the Bible. That you clap your hands. Now, one of the things that I think of when clapping my hands. To me, clapping your hands sounds like the sounds of broken chains hitting the ground. Chains breaking and crashing to the ground. So every time we collectively clap our hands, it's the sound of breaking chains hitting the ground. People being set free from their sins, people being set free from their addictions, people being set free from their problems. And so if he said to us, you clap your hands, I shouldn't need anybody else trying to make me do it or trying to encourage me to do it. I should willingly want to clap my hands. Amen? Amen. I should want to clap my hands. And he said, shout unto the Lord with a loud voice, with a triumphant voice. And I should want to do that. Now, Clayton, if you're at a football game, you scream until you lose your voice. Because it's fun. Football games should not get more noise than church. Football games shouldn't have more people clapping their hands and lifting their voice in triumph than church. We should clap our hands. We should lift our voice in triumph. We should make it known that we have been set free. The psalmist said, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. And so we should sing praises during church service, but we should also sing praises on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You shouldn't have any trouble singing along in your car. Now, there was a day when you might worry that the person next to you might think you're weird. But you don't have to do that anymore. Everyone already looks weird now. They've either got some kind of Bluetooth thing here or it's on their car. And if you're like me, you've got the volume turned up so loud that the person at the red light can hear your conversation. So just go ahead and praise the Lord in your car. Praise the Lord in your house. Praise the Lord in your bedroom. David said all the night I made my bed to swim as he was basically fretting over something. And then he talks about until I started realizing who God is. And until, until I started praising the Lord. Until I started realizing that God works all things out. And then he says I began to praise the Lord. And so when you're stressed in your moment and, and you're laying there and you can't sleep at night and whatever problem it is is, is struggling uh, uh, to keep a grip on your heart and your mind and, and you're struggling, uh, you go ahead and praise the Lord right then and there. You don't have to turn the lights on. You don't have to, to go kneel down anywhere. You can lay right there in your bed and start singing to the Lord. You can lay right there in your bed and start just thanking the Lord for how great he is and how awesome he is. You can just start loving the Lord laying right there. And before you know it, you'll be waking up with the alarm clock going off because you fell asleep praising the Lord. But we need to make sure we have praise and worship in the church. It blesses the services when we have praise and worship in the church. The Bible says in Acts 16, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And then it says this, the prisoners heard them. 
You need to make sure everyone around you in church hears you. You need to make sure everybody hears you. Lift your voice and sing. And you say, well, I'm not a good singer. Buddy, by the time it gets to heaven, it sounds good to God. It may not sound good to people here, but you're not singing to me. You're singing to him. Go ahead and clap your hands. Go ahead and lift your voice. Go ahead and sing. Go ahead and, and make a joyful noise. The Bible says the prisoners heard them singing, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. So when you clap your hands, and when you lift your voice, and when you sing, and when you say amen, and when you shout hallelujah, you begin to cause other people to worship. You begin to cause other people to hear your praise and to hear your worship. And then their chains are broken. Their prison doors swing open. Uh, you need to be a part of your own freedom, but you also need to realize that your praise and worship is the freedom of others. You say, my, my child is addicted to alcohol or tobacco or drugs or whatever they're addicted to. Go ahead and start praising God for breaking the chains of addiction. Go ahead and start praising God for tearing down the high places of the enemy. Go ahead and worship God in church service on Sunday knowing that God is doing a great work. Right. Amen? Amen? The greatest thing about praise is it's contagious. I don't know if it's actually the greatest thing, but I love that part of it. I love that part. It, it, go to youth camp. It doesn't take but one or two of them to start jumping up and down. And before you know it, the entire group of young people are all jumping up and down. It's contagious. So how can I help my church? The next thing on the list of how can I help my church is invite people to church every week and teach them the word. Disciple them. Now, I love to teach Bible studies, and I'm always willing to teach Bible studies. But I am not the perfect teacher for every person. Sometimes you have the right personality for that person. Now, there are a few of us here that know significantly more about the word of God and have a lot more experience in that, and that's totally fine. Strengths and weaknesses, we talked about it. But that doesn't give you an out. Sometimes you're the person who needs to be doing it. And I, I want you to hear me for a second. Would you rather someone get a four-minute Bible study while you're fishing or while you're shopping or no Bible study at all? Would you rather someone get a 10-minute Bible study while you're taking them to the store or no Bible study at all? So you need to understand that inviting people to church and discipling people is not just my job. It's also your job. Jesus said this in Luke 14. The Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He said, you go out everywhere in the good parts of town, the bad parts of town, the right part, and the wrong part, the north and the south, the east and the west. You go everywhere and you compel them to come in. Go ahead and tell them, hey, if you come to church with me, I'll take you to Applebee's afterwards. I've told you multiple times about the man in my dad's church who would do... Uh, uh, errands for people. He'd paint a door. Or he'd fix a fence or whatever. And they'd say, well, how can, how can uh, uh, I pay you back? And he'd say, you got to come to church Sunday. Yeah. And he's won people to God just by doing chores for people. He said, compel them to come into the house of the Lord. And then he told us in Matthew, he said, go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples. You make disciples. He told us, he said, I want you to go out into the highways and the hedges here, there, and everywhere, 
and make disciples. Now, I have a responsibility as the pastor of this church to ensure that people learn what the word of God is, that they hear the gospel preached because it's by the foolishness of preaching that people are saved. But I can't get everybody into this church, but we collectively can. It was only 12 people who turned the world upside down, and I can count more than 12 people here. And so we collectively need to invite people to the house of the Lord. Amen. So if you'll do this, God will bless your efforts. Just do, do this. First of all, pray and fast. And then just make up your mind, I'm going to make sure I invite at least one person each day. It could be the cashier at the grocery store. Could be the cashier at the gas station. You go into work, it could be one of your co workers. You go out to get the mail, you realize your neighbor's out there. I've got a novel idea. Talk to your neighbor. I know that's strange and weird, but go ahead. Talk to your neighbor. And just find a way to invite one person to church. And if you get towards the end of your day and you realize, I haven't invited anyone to church yet. I, I, you know, we use it for everything else. And if you're like, oh, it's, it's so hard to ask somebody that, send them a text message. Just shoot them a text and say, hey, I want you to come to church with me Sunday. Amen? Amen? Jesus told us, he said, you, you compel them to come. And so I want you to hear when I tell you this. I believe with all my heart that if you will just invite one person a day to church, that maybe none of those people you've invited come, but God will put somebody in a seat because of what you did. Yes, Nothing you do is going to come back without reward. You're not going to put forth an effort and you get no reward back. You go ahead and invite people and you say, I invited someone every single day and none of them came. Yeah, but we had 17 visitors. God will reward your efforts. You don't worry about the outcome. You just worry about what he told you to do, which is compel them to come. So then the next thing is, what can I do to help my church? Give. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the, same meat, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I, I don't know about you, but I like that. Here's a dozen apples, and he says, well, I'll give you back 40. Here's $20 worth of groceries. And he says, I'll give you back 50. Constantly, the Lord finds ways to bless you. And he said, I'll bless you out of the bosom of men. He didn't say, I'm going to send a check to you in the mail. He didn't say, you're going to find $1,000 cash on the sidewalk. That may happen. But that's not what he said. He said, I'll bless you out of the bosom of men. Somebody will turn around and bless you. Little things like this happen. We have the greatest mechanic in the world. Our, our mechanic's just awesome. His name's Mike Moss, he's phenomenal. And he charges us so much less than anybody else and does so much better work than anybody else. And there's not a doubt in my mind that God blesses you with people like that when you're a giver. Because imagine how much more money goes out when you can't trust the mechanic. And so you have to look at all those blessings. And we were dropping off my wife's truck to Mr. Moss this week, and, and uh, we were talking to him about different things. And, and, and so he said to me, he said, he goes, I'm, I just, I can't hardly handle it. He said, he goes, I'm just overwhelmed with how many people want to do business with me. And I said, you are a blessing to people. That's why they want to be with you. They, they trust you and they like you. You're a blessing to people. And, and he says, I, I can't even keep up with 
with all the demand. And, and, and so you think about that, and you realize that God has blessed you with this kind of person. It's a blessing. Now, Malachi 3 says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And so with all the giving that is talked about in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always kind of open. It's always kind of open. They give heave offerings. Uh, you got the two mites that gave all, she gave all, and then, and then you have those who give out of their abundance. And it's always kind of open except for tithing. The only thing that's not open is tithing. He said, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse. This is the storehouse. Amen? He said, you bring your tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I don't know about you, but I like the idea of God opening the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings too great for me to receive. I don't know about you, but I like that. And so I obey the word of God, and I always make sure that I bring my tithes into the storehouse. Now, I give to other things for multiple reasons. One reason is because Jesus said. Another reason is because I want to be blessed. Another reason I give is because I want to lead you to give. And so... We must be givers. Now, I will tell you, this church is a great giving church, and I'm very thankful for that. But I want to reiterate that we must pass on from generation to generation to generation to be givers. Amen? Your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren should know that giving to God is the best way to live a blessed life. So how can I bless my church? How can I help my church? The next thing on the list is to be faithful and to minister. The best things to do are to be faithful and minister. Be faithful in your praise. Be faithful in your worship. Be faithful in, in prayer. Be faithful in fasting. Be faithful in giving. Be faithful in attendance. And help others to be faithful. Send a card or a note, a text message, a phone call. Whenever you see someone missing, any time that you realize someone's not here, they should know you care. They should know you care. You should encourage others. You should lift others up. You need to be a part of reaching out and saying, we're a family. Have any of you, I know none of you have ever done this because you all are all perfect, but, but I have caught my little tiny toe on the corner of a, uh, of a table leg in the dark, walking, you know, trying to sneak to the kitchen to get a glass of water in the middle of the night. And I was trying to be quiet, not wake up anyone. Instead, I wake up the whole neighborhood because my little tiny toe caught the corner of the chair or the table. And my little tiny toe let the whole entire body know that this is a problem. Just this week, I told you that one tooth let my whole body know you have a problem. Paul said we're all members of the body. We're all members of the body. And so we together, it isn't just the head that knew about the toe. My whole body starts jumping up and down. It isn't just, just the brain that knows about the tooth. The, the entire side of my head hurt because of the tooth, and then my stomach started hurting because I couldn't eat. We, you know, we're all connected. We're members, one together, right? And so you need to make sure that you communicate with others who are not here and let them know that you miss them. And then I want to say this, and I'm preaching to the choir because this is the Wednesday night group. But do not miss church any more than absolutely necessary. That is a great way to help the church. Now, you, you need a vacation. Everyone needs a vacation. I need to take one. You need to take one. Sometimes we're sick. Sometimes we have uh, uh, family issues that call us out of town. But missing church should be something that we do everything we can to avoid. This should be the most important thing we do each week. 
Attending service should be the most important thing. And the writer of Hebrews said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more, the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The rapture. The Lord is coming back soon and we need to get together and we need to talk about it. I preach about the rapture quite a bit and I'm going to keep preaching about the rapture until either he comes back or I die, one of the two. But this you need to know. You don't need to miss church because the last thing you want to be is at home watching television when the trumpet sounds. That used to be okay to preach. Jesus is coming back soon. And David said this. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. There is no better place to be than at church. And Asaph said, when I thought to know that the, the evil people were being blessed and doing well, it was too painful for me until I went to church. And, and there's no other place that you should be on Sunday or Wednesday or any scheduled prayer meeting than church. Amen. Amen. I love to go out to eat. I love it. I just do. I like the fact that everyone can get what they want to eat. I like the fact that I don't have to wash the dishes. I like to go out to eat. But going out to eat won't do for you what coming to church will do. Some of you love to go shopping. Some of you love to go fishing. Some of you love to go hunting. Some of you love to go riding bikes or doing this or that or whatever. And all those places are fun and good. But no place will help you and bless you like the church. I should be preaching this piece on Sunday. You need to make sure you're in the house of the Lord. Now, Obed Edom. Obed had the Ark of the Covenant left at his house for 90 days. And the Bible says that the 90 days that it was there at his home, that his house was blessed abundantly. And there's indication to us that he was financially better off when the Ark of the Covenant was in his home and that, that the uh, servants and, and, and the different people in his, in his group and his work and his labors were all blessed in different ways, including having children. They found out while the ark was there that they were expecting a child. All kinds of things were happening in Obed's house. And then we also know that when the Ark of the Covenant was taken, that he said, I'd rather be with the Ark than be at home. He said, I I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than be at home. And I'm thankful for what the, the people do who greet us as we come to church every Wednesday and Sunday, but that's not what a doorkeeper meant in the Old Testament. Being a doorkeeper in the Old Testament was significantly less desirable than anything we do here. And, and so you need to understand, Obed was saying, the very lowest position I'd rather do than stay at home. I'd rather do the worst thing than stay at home. And Jesus said, this is a house of prayer. And this is a sanctuary, which is a place for refuge. It's a place for help. If you have a, a bird sanctuary, it's a place where birds cannot be shot or hunted or hurt. And, 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 and if you have an animal sanctuary, it's a place where uh, hunters can't come after them. And, and, and this is a sanctuary. This is a safe place. The church is the ark that rises above the flood. The church is the ark that survives the storm. The church is the awesome place that protects you, protects your family. So you need to be in the church. You need to be around the church. You need to be near the church. You need to be here as much as you can possibly be here. Yes, sir. That's right. Amen. The next thing that we can do to help our church is to volunteer. Second Chronicles 24 came to pass that after this, that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. 
Every, everyone, including me, point at yourself. Everyone point at yourself and say, it's my responsibility. Now, we all have strengths and weaknesses. We all have strengths and weaknesses. I can eat, but I can't cook. And you don't want me to try. Unless you like burnt water. We all have strengths and weaknesses. You know what your strengths are, and you need to find a way to use your strengths here to help us around the building. You can help us with your time. And time is one of the reasons why we need your help. Weather is one of the reasons why we need your help. I'm getting ready to, I keep, I don't know why I just keep apologizing for all this junk. When it snows like crazy and I have to come and I come early and pray and turn all the lights and heat and Brother Hoffman helps me do that and turn on the sound and, and, and practice music and sing and I'm trying to get my head right for service and I have to go out and shovel all the sidewalks too. I don't mind telling you that by the time I get here, I'm a little worn out. I'm a little toast by the time I get here. And I don't mind shoveling sidewalks, and when possible, I come and shovel them on Friday or Saturday. But if it snows Saturday night, come on, men. Everybody show up. Shovel two feet, and we'll be done in a few minutes. Amen? That was free. But if you want to help them clean in the inside of the church, talk to my wife. If you want to help cleaning up on the outside or doing anything like that, talk to Brother Davis. One of the two of them. They got plenty to put you to work doing. Brother Fred Dill did the maintenance on this building by himself. I think it was for 300 years. It was a long time, though, wasn't it? And, and he's one of those that's very particular. And so he would come and do it by himself. And one day I came to the church and and he had dug out the entire corner out from underneath the building over there, and he was putting in concrete to shore up the corner of the building by himself. The difference between Brother Dill and me is I don't want to do it by myself. And I'm thankful for all the years that that man worked here and kept this place so awesome. Very thankful for it. That was for you, Brother Dill. I'm very thankful for all the years that he did that. But I need you to help me with this campus. I need you to help me with this campus. Um, and someone's already taken care of this, so nobody run out and try to do this. But at the men's breakfast, I found one of the toilet seats in the other building on the floor. And I, I shouldn't walk in there and find that. Now, someone's already taken care of it, so nobody rush out to try to fix it. Thank, and I'm very thankful for Brother Velarde going to fix it. Appreciate that. Because it takes all of us. It takes all of us. But let me also say this. Brother Velarde's in the kitchen on Saturday cooking, and, and Brother Davis is in there, and, and Brother Barley helps him a little bit. But they don't need all 20 of us going in the kitchen trying to help them cook. Somebody else can go set up tables and chairs. Somebody else can sweep up the floor when we're done. Somebody else can take out the trash. There's all kinds of stuff to do to be involved. We don't have to get on top of each other. And so I don't know what your strengths and weaknesses are, but you do. And so Brother Hoffman comes early every service to help open up the building, unlock all the doors, turn on the HVACs. And, and, and in July, aren't you thankful he comes and turns on the air? Yeah. And he's been doing that for, what, a thousand years? Something like that? And, and y'all just keep getting older and older. I guess it's because I'm getting older. But I'm thankful for everything you do. And I told you in the beginning, this is positive. But here's what I'm asking you to do. 
Look for things to do. Look for things to do. So I'm going to embarrass my kids here for a second. I saw a dryer sheet on the floor where one of them carried their laundry to their room, as, as a good teenager should do, and the dryer sheet fell off, off the basket right at the top of the staircase. So I come up the stairs, and I started to get I'm like, no, I'm going to see how long it stays here. So they went up and down the stairs, you know, a hundred times. I go up there the next day, it's still there. I go up there the next day. Finally, like three days later, I'm like, somebody come pick up this dryer sheet. And they're like, it's just a dryer sheet. I'm like, but it's been there for three days. And both of my kids were like, well, I didn't even see it. If it had been a snake, it would have bit them. If it had been a wire, it would have tripped them. They had to step over it time and time again. But we as adults are just as guilty as my two teenagers about coming in and out of this church building and, and, and not even noticing that something needs to be taken care of. Now, before I leave this and go to the last topic, let me say this. The Bible says in Chronicles 29, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man. Not for man, but for the Lord God. And so he says this, he says, I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for the things made of gold, the silver for the things of silver, brass for the things of brass, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistening stones, uh, glistering stones and of diverse colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. And then he says, moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of God, because I love the house of the Lord. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after. He said, because I've set my affection to the house of God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And then I want you to skip down to the second half of verse 20, or chapter 29, verse 5. And then it says this, he says, And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And if you read verses 4 and 5, he says it. He said, 3,000 talents of gold, Gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house where it He said, all this gold and silver to put on the walls. For the things of gold, for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver. And then look at this sentence. He says, all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. In other words, all the work for those who have the strengths to do it. For those who have the ability to do it. For those who have the mind to do it. And he says, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And so I need to find out what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses. Something I can do is I can vacuum the building. I don't mess that up. I can do that. And so I do. I participate in vacuuming the building. But there's something that everyone can do. So everyone needs to be involved some way, shape, or form. So if you want to do anything on the inside of the building, coordinate it with Sister Williams. And she'll try to make sure that 17 people aren't doing the same thing. And if you want to do anything on the outside of the building, please see Brother Davis. And he'll try to make sure that we're not all trying to do the same thing. Or if we need five guys doing it, that five guys are there to do it. I'm trying to rush. But the last topic is unity. What can I do to help my church? Unity. Unity. Genesis 11, 5 and 6, it says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Talking about the Tower of Babel. So he came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. The people are unified. The people are together. And they have all one language. They're all talking the same way. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. God said, when the people of man come together, 
for good or evil, it doesn't matter. Nothing is restrained from them. When you come together in unity, nothing can stop us. When we come together in unity, nothing can stop us. When we come together as one, nothing can stop us. The Lord said, this is, this is God speaking. He said, nothing will be restrained from them because they are one. They're all talking the same talk. They're walking the same walk. They're all doing the same thing. They're all praising and worshiping together. They're all fasting together. They're all going to prayer meeting together. They're all uh, giving together. They're all working together. They all have the same mind. They're in one mind and one accord. And nothing shall be restrained from them. So when we are one, there's nothing we cannot do and nothing we cannot accomplish. And so Jesus prayed this. He said, neither pray I for these alone, but also for them which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one. It was the prayer of the Son of Man that we would be unified. It is absolutely the will of God that we come together as one body, unified, unity. Amen? Amen. Look at what God combined together here. In Proverbs 6, verse 16, he said, Six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. Now look what, look what he put together. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Doing anything that is destructive to the unity of the church and causing division is the same thing as telling a lie, being proud, and murdering somebody. I don't want to be a part of bringing division in the church. I don't want to be a part of that. Sowing discord, destroying the unity of the church, that puts you in the same hell as murders. You know, we're so quick to say thieves and murderers are going to hell. Well, so are those who sow discord. I don't want to go to hell. I'm not going to do it. It's the will of God that we be unified. It's the will of God that we have unity in the church. It is the will of God that we be one. So how can I help the church. How can I bless the church? How can I bless this church? Well, it's prayer. It's fasting. It's worship and praise. It's inviting people and discipleship. It's giving. It's being faithful. It's, it's ministering one to another. It's volunteering and it's unity. That's how I can bless the church. Amen. Amen. 